afternoon, everyone. How are you today? How's everyone? I'm Anna P. Santos, and I am a columnist for Rappler. I write about women's sexual health rights. And I have to tell you, I think I have the most enviable job in the world. I write about women's sexual health rights in the context of empowerment. But what does that mean? What does that word empowerment mean? It's a word that you and me both have heard quite a lot. But what does it mean exactly? Does it mean overcoming perceptions? Does it mean breaking through glass ceilings or going beyond the limitations that we set on ourselves? Outside, there's a little photo there where I saw a lot of girls enjoying themselves, taking photographs with little placards. And they wrote things like, they said I could never make it in a man's world. They said bossy girls were just not gonna cut it. And I myself put up a placard that said, they said I was just, in all caps, a single mom. And I could see from the photos that you've shared that there's so much fun and yet fulfillment in breaking barriers, debunking labels, so we can all shine. And there's also something that has to be said about how we can mobilize as ourselves as a global community in times of natural disaster or emergency. In that way, empowerment also has a selfless angle. When we're empowered, we reach beyond ourselves and we extend ourselves to help others. And that's exactly why Rappler and Pantene have put together this forum, so we can have an intimate chat. You know, little girl talk, and some of the guys are here too. So we can talk about what, where women today stand on issues like work-life balance, family, social life, beauty and career, and the quintessential being the best that we can be. We're calling this How We Women Whip It. I'm not gonna preempt the presentation this afternoon, but I will tell you that we have a lot to talk about today, and we have very inspiring women as guests on our panel. They will talk about how, just like you and me, they've had their own struggles with self-doubt, with perception, and how they overcame them. We'll also hear from other men and women in Metro Manila who were surveyed by our friends at Lilo Research on this same issue. And when you have that aha moment, or what we call at Rappler, awe-inspiring moments, and I know there will be lots of them, share them with others. Tweet with the hashtag WhipIt, or share photos that you've taken at our photo booth with the same WhipIt hashtag. We're also live blogging and live streaming this forum, so you can invite your friends to watch and join the conversation by going to rappler.com. We've got a full afternoon ahead of us, and I'm very happy to kick off this event with a gentleman on board. I think it's fitting that we kick off a women's forum with a gentleman. And I'll tell you why. Here with a few words on why we should whip it is Pepe Torres, brand manager for Total Hair Care, Procter & Gamble, Philippines. It's an honor to be able to speak in front of such a distinguished community on why we think this movement is so important. So why whip it? First, I, I want to start with what Pantene, oh sorry, I should be moving to the next slide. What is whip it? Sorry about that guys, some technical difficulties. But let me start with why we're doing this. It's because of what the brand Pantene believes in. First, we think that beauty is power. When you feel beautiful, you're unstoppable. Second, Pantene is not just in the hair care business. It's in the personal success business. And finally, we think that real beauty, and we don't just mean how you look externally, takes hard work. And we are here to support women on that journey. So then, what is Whippet? It's a call to action that evokes a sense of empowerment. Look at it as uh, maybe a more mature version of you go girl. Second, it urges women to cast aside societal prejudices that hold them back. Because we think that the worthiest successes in life come from true effort and brave moves. 
yet society has not fully accepted women who are, as you can already see, too bold or confident. Why is there such a thing for women, yet for men, that doesn't seem to exist? Now I'd like to share, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, and I guess to refresh our memory, the video uh, which kicked off this spark of a movement. Not sure what happened. Maybe there was again a little bit of a technical difficulty, but the uh, correct video would have uh, had a very beautiful rendition of Mad World um, by uh, a Filipina, which really I think lent uh, uh, a lot of weight to the imagery that we were showing. Maybe we'll have a chance to show the video again later. But first, I, I would like to say uh, a big thank you to the team, our partners at BBDO Guerrero, who helped develop. Uh, this campaign who helped come up with the insight uh, behind uh, this entire uh, spark of a movement. Now the really cool thing is since we aired this a few weeks ago people have been responding. Great song, great concepts, nice thing to hear. Very empowering, maybe that's closer to where we want to be. I love when uh, people are responding and playing back um, the message and I think owning it. You know, it's amazing. Don't let labels hold you back. Hashtag love being a woman. And it's also uh, really cool to see that people are resonating with the insights that are in there. Pantene's new commercial is gold. Again, nice to see. Don't let labels hold you back. So. Clearly, folks are responding to the video and what it stands for, the insight behind it and the message we're trying to send. But not all responses are positive. There's this guy, for example, and I'll be very transparent. Ignorance by consumerism. Really not happy with it, actually. Let me guess, this commercial was created, conceptualized by a female or gay male ad exec who feels the need to empower women in a society where she feels oppressed by men. It's very long, so I'm gonna just uh, capture what I thought were his key points. Why all the envy towards men who happen to be confident, etc. When women are seen as bossy, pushy, selfish, and vain, maybe it's simply because they are. And finally, uh, this commenter mentions you know, does this propagate even more sexism and all in order to sell a damn shampoo? Too bad. It's a good commercial, but with a horrible message. So actually, this came out pretty quickly after the uh, video uh, came out. I saw these comments, and for a while, I thought about it, and I decided, hey, we live in a different age where we get to respond and interact and have a dialogue and a conversation with consumers, and that's actually why we started this. So I actually decided to respond. And I would like to read out to you my full response because I think it captures not just what the company believes in and why we're doing this, but also personally uh, why I believe in it and what I think is at stake. So let me read out to you my full response.
first, of course, I had to say thanks for commenting and sharing your point of view. For full disclosure, uh, I'm with PNG Philippines, the company behind Pantene. First, I was one of the people who worked on developing this movement and this commercial. And I'm happy to tell you that this was not conceptualized by a female or gay male ad exec, as he suggested. I'm male and straight, not that there's anything wrong with being gay. And the greater team behind this was very diverse in gender and probably sexuality, though I didn't really care to inquire about the latter. So I'm glad that's out of the way. Second, I'd like to address your point of view. Our intention is to show that when men and women do the exact same thing, especially in the workplace, men tend to have the benefit of the doubt, and women have a higher tendency to be judged and labeled unfairly. There's more than a few studies and assertions from, and assertions from very credible people around this. So I shared with him a couple of links which interestingly enough were actually shared by either consumers or some of my own colleagues in response to the video. And they said, you should check this out because it really seems to be reinforcing your message. So I continue. This gender bias bleeds into other aspects of society as well. For example, in a study we developed with Rappler, for which we will find out more later, we found that a majority of Filipinos believe that it's more acceptable for men to have extramarital affairs versus women. Personally, this is how I knew that we were onto something real. When I saw the first conceptualization of this video, I felt something inside me and I started tearing up. Though of course, I tried to hide it. Talk about uh, gender bias. It was actually guilt. I knew that I was guilty of judging women the same way, which is a shame because I was very lucky to grow up around three very strong women, my mom and my two sisters. That's when I knew we had to do this. So here's one of my sisters. Her name is Monica. She has been Iron Woman for the Philippines four times. She is probably the strongest woman I know and I've not met anyone so fiercely dedicated to being number one in the world at what she does. That is literally what she wants to be the number one triathlete in the world. It's clear she's number one in the Philippines, but she wants to take it higher. Finally, I want to address your concern that you believe it's a shame that this was all just to sell shampoo. Pantene as a brand believes that we exist to help women and their world shine. Yes, we do this through our products, which we create, develop, and improve to give women better and better hair. But we also looked broadly at what was holding a woman back from shining. And it was very clear that it was labels, double standards, and gender bias. Like it or not, brands have a lot of media clout because of advertising budgets. Personally, I would like to embrace a world in which brands are able to use this influence to be agents of positive social change. Thanks for commenting, and I hope you keep an open mind. If you feel strongly about your point of view, I suggest you follow the conversation and material we're developing in partnership with Rappler that explores this movement even further. I think that summarizes not just how I, but also the company feels about the beginning uh, of this movement on Whippet. And we really hope that we join together in making this a true movement and something that really uh, impacts the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pepe, for sharing that. When we were looking over the materials for today, and we were rehearsing, and I was looking over Pepe's slide, there were two things that struck me. First was that tweet or that comment about how we are in a world where we're oppressed by men. And two, his slide about his sister, Monica. And I was talking to him about this backstage and I said, you know, I think that just goes to show that men are not the enemy here. In a lot of cases, we women are supported by the men we love and the men, we lo the men who love us. And they can be our best partners for the goals that we want to achieve. Thank you very much.
So on that note, I would also like to hear from, we would also like to call on Rappler's Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director, Maria Ressa, on how Rappler is going to be the platform of education, discussion, and debate on this movement. Maria? Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for taking time to come and uh, we will, I want to push it forward so you get to what we really want you to see today, which is how our society sees women. Um, we have, there are all these surveys globally, but what about the Philippines? Where are we? Before I get to that, and Chai will give that to you, I want to tell you a little bit about Rappler. Rappler wants to change the world. We couldn't have existed five years ago because the technology didn't exist. And one of the ways we will change the world is with the use of technology. Let me show you where we are. So this is, we made up the name Rappler. Even that, right? As a journalist, you don't make up words. So we had a huge debate. Do we make up a word to talk about serious journalism? We did, we jumped in because we figured, well, Google didn't really exist before Diva is a word. So the core of Rappler is this. It's the words to rap plus ripple to make waves. And I want to talk about the ripples that are just in this room alone. Our core is professional journalism. The second circle is technology. Um, and if you're tweeting and you're using the hashtag whip it, you're seeing your ripples expand beyond this room. And then this is the last part, what technology enables. It allows us to be able to capture what I started calling online bayanihan, crowdsourcing. What is crowdsourcing? Crowdsourcing is really all of us doing one small thing to create something that wasn't there before to make a better world. And this is where Rappler stands, smack in the middle. The other technological changes are all there. Um, we create content which is amplified by social media. Social media connects with each one of you, not even, and with people outside the room to bring you in to the third part, which is crowdsourcing, online by Anihan. And then the last part is if you have everyone doing this small act, you create big data. And big data is is the major disruptor of every industry in the world. So that's, that's what goes into Rappler. I wanna talk about why we're doing this with Pantene, why we're doing Whip It. Why is it time? You know, when I first heard Whip It, I thought, if you're my age, some of you are, you will think song, right? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, okay, I will try to behave. Um, uh, Whip it has different connotations, which we threw around, right? But in the end, it's about beating something. So let me show you what social media is to me, which is in the end, it's taking your social networks on steroids. It's putting your physical social networks on steroids because it gets rid of boundaries of time and space. So here's how you create the ripples. And I'm going to show you very specifically something that is personal to me, and I guess this is part of the reason I've thrown myself into this also. This is a long time ago. Um, it's a hostile environment training course. Uh, we were, use, we were, were wearing chem bio warfare suits. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this person on the, on the left here, that person, her name is Judith Torres. She was my producer at CNN. And I only found out last week that her son, Pepe Torres, conceptualized this campaign. I say it because what went into his head, I think, was part of our discussion in 1986 about why women act the way they do in our societies. Why do we accept labels? Why do we accept what other people want us to be? Why do we not chart our own path? And back then, so to show you my age, I won't end up that, but I haven't shown this to him, but he was still a baby when we were having these debates. And Judith is very, very far from a conventional Pinay. 
she's a fighter, and she fights for so much, sometimes too much, right? We have to know what, we're, what battles we're going to fight and what battles we're going to choose to win and which battles we let go of. So that's a ripple. And last week I found out Pepe was, um, was the one who, was, who brought this campaign, and I liked the campaign even more. Why am I telling you this? So here's why whip it for me and for Rappler. It's personal for every woman and man because these gender stereotypes are built into each of us. It's, it's part of our cultural DNA. And oftentimes we don't think about it. We just do it. We fall into the trap. The second is there are all these social conformity experiments all around the world. What are they? They basically show the power of the, of the group over the individual. And I'll tell you about this because I studied this when I was looking at why terrorism exists. Why do people kill themselves thinking that they're doing the right thing? One social conformity experiment I'll tell you about happened in the 1950s. It was done by a man named Solomon Ash. He basically took, let's say, the group of people in the front row and he put them in a room and he gave them sheets of paper and on the sheets of paper were lines. And he just asked the group to tell him what the shortest line was. Except unknown to the test subject, let's say this gentleman, Josh, I know him so I'll use him. Um, he's the test subject, but before he answers, he's the last person to answer the question, everyone else will answer the exact opposite. They'll give the longest line, and by the time the test subject responds, 75% of the people who are tested will go with what the group says, even if it's obviously wrong. It's the power of groups. More than three quarters of people will follow the group. It shows you how important peer pressure is and how peer pressure can actually change our reality, right? Um, that's the second step is I think we should figure out what peer pressure is, particularly in the Philippines. We travel in groups. The third, NCR study, the National Capital Region, and we chose the National Capital Region because we're supposed to be the most educated, most liberal, hopefully most open about a global landscape, right? So the NCR, that's part of the reason the study was there. And the study is with both men and women, and Chai will be telling you a lot more about it, but here's what sticks when you look at it, the big picture view. There is a difference between what we want to be and what we really are. That's what the NCR survey tells us. Um, there is a difference between aspirational and what we're doing in our life. There's a gap between what people say and what they do. And you're going to tell me, well, that's kind of normal. It's called hypocrisy. Um, not really. It's not called hypocrisy if you're kind of, if you're not aware. And that's part of the reason we're doing this. Because we want people, men and women, to discuss, to debate. And in the process, we become self-aware, we educate, we question our values, and hopefully we get to a place where change does happen. I'm not the first to say it, you know this phrase, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi, be the change you want to see, to change the world, you change yourself. And here's the last part of that NCR survey. The women do it to themselves. And I see a group of women activists who I know will tell me they don't do it to themselves. Society makes them do that. Yes and no. I guess I believe, and it's the same thing I said at the Climate Change Commission um, meet gathering this morning, we buy into it. And I would, that's the last part. That's the last reason why we're doing this, because we want you to be aware of what you're buying into. This is the user engagement model of Rappler. Why Rappler? Because Rappler not just gives you information, it also measures your response. Neuroscientists say that we don't act based on what we think. We act. 80% of how we act is based on how we feel. I've spent my, most of my entire career thinking, 
trying to fight emotions. But in the end, we're writing for people who are emotional. Up to 80% of how you make decisions in your life is based on how you feel. That's what the mood meter is about. Every story on Rappler has a mood meter, and each of these, every vote on each of those stories brings you to the mood navigator, which, which basically puts together all the votes for the t mood of the day. Once you have the mood of the day, you can look at what the month looks like or by December, what the year looks like. That's when it becomes big data. So I just want to show you what big data looks like for the month of May because it's interesting to me. The month of May was a happy month for the Philippines. Um, elections, we were happy. 77%, if you go by the data, we were happy. But look, on the 11th, on May 11th, we were, we, there was a spike of happiness because we were getting ready for elections. But look on election day, on May 13th, the happiness went down and angry, red, went up and annoyed went up because of the slow election returns. And then you see when the Senate, when the senator, the winners of the Senate were announced on the 23rd, 22nd, 23rd, we were really happy again, there's a spike. And then look at the tail end of the month, there's that spike of red. You remember what made you angry at the end of the month of May? The data tells us it's not politics. It was Vice Ganda and Jessica Soho. <laughs> um, it really angered Pinoy's, our readers. So I, I show you this because this is the kind of data we'd like to be able to also get based on the stories that you'll be seeing on Whippet. Content creation, social media amplification, crowdsourcing, and then big data. We go back to this, and I'll, we're journalists. I've been a journalist all my life. Rappler is an organization whose core is journalism. But times are changing. That core of journalism is meeting technology. And we want to help women and men see the world the way it is today, to have the self-awareness to actually change it actively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for talking to us about how conversations and discussions like this create ripples. I think that was a great example about how Maria was once working with Pepe's mom, and now Pepe's mom, uh, Pepe is here now starting the Whippet movement with us today. And I'd also like to, to say that I see among this audience a number of women who were the forerunners of the women's movement here in the Philippines. If we're going to talk about ripples, we need to applaud these women who started the change that we see today, and we have them to thank for, for the many liberties and the many privileges that we enjoy today as women. I think that it's best to show them that we're going to carry this forward. I see Jean, Marilyn, Maiti, the princess might have left, but these are the forerunners of, of the women's movement here in the Philippines. These women are the best examples of how you don't let labels hold you back and how you can choose to shine. Actually, that's what Whip It is all about. It's a challenge to all of us. It's a challenge for all of us to be empowered and to shine boldly by defying labels and stereotypes. And I'm really very excited to introduce to you today the women who have taken up this challenge and succeeded in their various fields of social activism, journalism, business, entertainment, and education. They have broken through those prohibitive labels and have come out strong and shining. Please join me in welcoming today our guest panel, starting with Ms. Feli Atienza. Feli was a director in top finance management for Merrill Lynch International and recognized as a formidable force who facilitated the first ever management buyout of a Merrill Lynch office. Currently, she is founder of the Chinese International School in Manila and Mrs. Kim Atienza. Feli confessed earlier to me that she grew up kind of like a tomboy, and I said, well, that might have helped you not so much in being Mrs. Kim Atienza, but maybe being in a, a, a man's world like Merrill Lynch. Please, round of applause for Ms. Feli Atienza. I'd like to call on Natasha Gutierrez, 
Natasha is graduated from Yale University with a degree in psychology on a full scholarship. She was co-editor of the Yale Journal of Human Rights and now a Rappler newscaster and multimedia reporter. Natasha humorously calls herself a dork. And if you don't believe her, she told me that she spent months on a Puerto Rican island studying monkeys for her senior thesis. And she found out that stereotyping is a product of evolutionary behavior or something like that. How's that for dorky? <laughs> a round of applause for Natasha Gutierrez. And I have the privilege of knowing Samira Gutuk. Samira, also one of our guest panelists today, was one of the 2001 The Young Women or TOYM awardees for youth and leadership in social and cultural development. She has worked with an array of stakeholders for more than 17 years as a journalist, manager, consultant, environmentalist, trainer, activist, and organizer. Samira takes down the barriers and prejudice by embracing her identity as an Islam woman while continuing to be a champion for bridging Muslim and women cultures. And don't let her fool you, she, she kicks a mean ball. She was founder of the, of the UP Women's Football League back in the day when we were in UP together. Please welcome Samira Guto. Sam, shall we also tell them that you wanted to be Little Miss Philippines when you were a kid? <laughs> also joining us is Miss Carrie Ilagan. Carrie was appointed as the first woman managing director of Microsoft Philippines. Through her own skills and talent, she worked her way up in the male-dominated field of IT. When it comes to success in the workplace and success at home, Carrie shows us how it's done. Carrie's all about work-life balance. And I have to tell you, her colleagues at Microsoft told us that Carrie has always rocked a mean bob. And I said, well, she probably brought that bob to the IT world in the same way that Anna Winter brought it to the fashion world. Thank you for joining us, Carrie. Round of applause. <laughs> and lastly, I'd like to call on Ji Tonji. Ji is certainly a familiar face. During the 90s, Ji was one of the most popular actresses and models on Philippine television. Today, Ji continues to define her own journey as an artist. And based in the Philippines with her American husband and two kids, Ji has effectively reinvented herself into a multi-hyphenated achiever as an actress, a documentary producer, business owner, journalist, and advocate for women's reproductive health rights. Ms. Ji Tuan Ji. Ji is actually quite literal when she says she reinvents herself. She told me that this is her seventh hairstyle change this year. How's that for changing all the time? Give me a minute to join these ladies, please. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Good afternoon to each and every one of you. I'd like to open this discussion by asking you to talk about your own labels labels that you had to contend with in the workplace, labels that you had to contend with maybe at home. Natasha, maybe we can start with you. Natasha has just come back from Macau in a, from a testosterone-filled ring covering the Manny Pacquiao fight. Yep. Tell us about um, labels that you had to contend with. Sure. Um, is my mic working? Fine. Um, I just came from Macau to cover the Manny Pacquiao fight for eight days, yeah. and I came in um, thinking I knew everything, I'm knowing that I know a lot about boxing, very confident about my own knowledge. I came in and it was 95% men. Um, there were probably only 5% women from all over the world, you know, journalists, but um, mostly reporters. And I was surprised, one, because the way they carried themselves was something somewhat unexpected for me. They basically wore short skirts and wore low-cut tops, which to me was pretty surprising. You know, we're in this testosterone-filled environment, and I'm trying to prove myself and my boxing knowledge, and the women around me aren't helping. Um, so that was pretty difficult, and for the first few days, I didn't really want to ask any questions. Um, it almost felt like if a woman journalist opened her mouth, all the men would turn around and kind of say, you know, they wouldn't say anything, but you could just feel um, some sort of expression in the air that was, I wonder if this woman knows what she's talking about. Um, so definitely it's a challenge every day. Um, they say, one label I've gotten or I've heard, I guess, is they say 
or at least they've said that when I've broken stories, it was because I was sleeping with someone. So it's a constant effort to just prove yourself um, that women can be successful uh, in journalism and not have to sleep around or not have to wear sexy clothing to advance themselves. It seems that they say women can only be successful if she's done something other than hard work. Work at somebody, not at something. You great, Carrie, Feli, do you want to comment on that? Well, um, <laughs> that's very interesting because I um, was in finance as well for about 12 years. I worked for, um, worked for JP Morgan Fleming as well as Merrill Lynch. Um, two years of that were in London. And they also said that my success was because I slept with all my clients. And I think it's just a universal uh, stigma for women that if you're successful, you slept your way to the top. Um, and what was very interesting was, I think I was in London at that time and a colleague said, well, you know, um, Felicia, for women, you're bitchy, but men, they're opinionated and they're aggressive. Women, we sleep our way to the top and men, they climb the corporate ladder. So just accept it. I'm gonna ask another woman who has made her way to the top in a male dominated field. Carrie, what has been some labels you've had to contend with in the workplace? Well, a lot. I think I had a change. But people also thought that I was, you know, I was on my way to the top. Maybe <laughs> I'm just as pretty as this. Um, mine's, uh, what I got was always Paki Alamera. So uh, it's, uh, th th that's a label that I got um, all the time. And I think it's because of, you know, you, you just get yourself involved in many things, you know, because you know, you're, you're, you're Paki Alamera because you're a woman. So I, I, I got that all the time in the workplace. But how did you make that work for you? Because being, uh, that can also mean being into details. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess it's uh, you know it, it's um, it, it's something. I, I think it's a it's a strong woman attribute, which is us being very um, detail oriented. Um, not just being detail oriented, but because I think um, women are just able to do or to multitask. I think, and I, I've always thought that's a that's a positive and a plus. Uh, especially in the workplace because you know you don't have to be you know it, it's not you know it's not one at a time so you get to do more and you get to accomplish more because um, I think that's a that's a very strong women um, attribute that you have and it helped me a lot I like that from Carrie Natasha and Feli the learning about how stereotypes and gender biases and this proverbial glass ceiling still exists in the workplace, but you can make those same gender biases, or maybe not the sleeping around part, but the, at least being into details, turn that around and make it work for you. I'm not going to ask G and Samira, you know, being in the media, Sam being an Islam woman, you're already kind of boxed in. What are some of the labels that you've had to contend with and break through? as an actress and as a model, I was called a lot of things. Uh, high class hooker. Oh, she's getting all these uh, roles because, you know, yes, she's sleeping with someone too. Uh, and I just felt that uh, as, especially being an actress and being in the media, uh, you don't see it when you're in it, but when you get a bird's eye view, you see the exploitation that happens. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that when I was starting my career as an actress, the kinds of films that were being portrayed were what we call tintillating films, okay? And at that point, that's when I had to really make a decision for myself, for my integrity as a woman, to be able to walk away from everything that the entertainment industry offers because I knew that my success would ultimately um, really rob me of what it means to be a woman. So I took the chance and I said, you know what, I have to, I have to get out of this in order to really empower myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, being a mother and coming back to the Philippines after, after raising my children on my own, 
I know for a fact that I'm the first to wake up in my household, I am the last to sleep, and women have that resilience that really makes us, like you said, multitaskers. And that's the thing, here, coming back to the Philippines and being a slashy actress, writer, documentarian, people are like, ay, batang ambi ambitiosa siya masyado. She's too ambitious, like it's a bad thing. And so I feel like as a woman, um, I, I'm constantly trying to break that, that it's not, it's not a bad thing to be ambitious and to go after your dreams and 